What's up, Nets fans? Welcome to the Brooklyn Buzz. I'm your host, Nick Faye. With me, as always, Jack Manuel. What's up, Jack? Sean Mox was listening yesterday, wasn't he, Nick? Surely. Yes, he definitely was. He checked out the poll on Twitter. He listened to our podcast. We definitely were talking Dinwiddie extension for a long time now, and today we finally got the news. Three-year deal, $34 million, player out on the third year. What were your thoughts on the contract right off the bat? I was literally uh, at work, you know, I was teaching, you know, we, we chucked a movie on for the kids because it's that time of year where it's Christmas and it's the end of the year for us uh, down here in Australia. So it's like your version of summer where you start doing the arts and crafts, all the little activities. And I have my phone on me, always have my phone out, catching the bleacher reports, any DMs from you or the OTG staff. And I saw the notification, I'm just like, I, I found it hard to contain myself. And I think <laughs> our boy Flatbush in Atlantic as well said, why does this feel like I'm getting paid? Uh, in a weird way, Spencer Dimity has like represented, you know, the come up. You know, I could probably say for Joe Harris as well, him getting that extension felt similarly to me as well. So to see Joe Harris, Spencer Dimity earn their keep, guys who were absolute cast offs in the NBA and now, you know, multi millionaires. And for Spencer Dimity getting a very hefty payday and very well deserved and still under market value. We said four years, 47.5, which is what he could have earned uh, as a maximum amount from the Nets would be, you know, a, a bargain, but we've still got him uh, for 334. And, you know, the, the structure of the deal uh, is also quite nice because it frees up the cap space for this season uh, in the free agency, you know, 10.6 million this season and uh, in 2019, then 11.4, then 12.3, and then that player option in the third year. So uh, it's good news all around for Nets fans, Spencer Dimody and the front office alike. Yeah, like you said, Jack, it's great news on all fronts, you know, from the Nets front, the fans front, and the Dinwiddie front. You know, touching on the Nets portion, bargain to get a player of this caliber at this price, the point guard position, somebody who fits in the system, gets along with Kenny, you know, is part of that culture fit, uh, culture fit, you know, getting that guy to stay with the Nets is what makes the fans happy. You know, getting a good player, staying with your team for at least two more seasons is a plus, and it's something that, you know, Nets fans aren't necessarily used to. So now they have this guy locked up that they developed, it feels good. And then on Dinwiddie front, you know, he has the player option for the third year. So right when he's hitting his prime around like 25, uh, 28, you know, he'll have the chance to really cash in. Yeah, and, and it works well for all parties. So, you know, the structuring of deals is always something that's really fascinating in today's NBA. And this just seems like a win-win-win, you know, all around, especially when it comes to Spencer himself. And like you mentioned, you know, hitting his prime, you know, he's certainly doing that right now. He still has, you know, you know some growth on his side. Obviously, we've seen, you know, the immense growth uh, that he's shown in the past two seasons. Uh, who's Who knows where he could be in three years' time as that deal uh, nears an end. But yeah, such an awesome story. You know, we got a lot of love from our OTG writers as well. Uh, you know, Dimwitty was trending. Uh, I was following all the tweets that were coming and, and spurting forth. It was it was awesome to see from a guy. You know, it just it's just an awesome sort of fairy tale story to come from. You know, being cast off by two teams and then get yourself paid and and work your way to basically one of the better, probably a six man of the year contender, and you know, a, certainly a, a capable starter for many teams in today's NBA. It, it's a really really great story, and it's something we're going to keep on harping on. And nice to have some positivity as well for the Nets. Yeah, Dan Woody, like you said, it is a great story. You know, tearing his ACL, I think, on his last college season, then getting drafted, and then getting cut by those teams ending up with the Nets then people questioning the Nets keeping him over Yogi Ferrell who's not even getting playing time in Sacramento everything just kind of worked out really well for him and like you said Jack you know he's still improving I think defensively there's still plenty of room for improvement we've seen the aggression kind of pick up this year where he's attacking in four quarters instead of just in the fourth or late in the game so I think there is improvements out there and he's somebody who's just going to keep benefiting from getting time in the NBA and in with the Nets coaching staff. Yeah, I think as well, the way you, you put out in your tweet as well, Nick, the it's a point guard heavy league. You need to have a quality point guard. And Spencer Dimwitty could be, you know, the future for the Nets, at least in the short term, as a starter. You know, obviously we can t chat about D'Angelo uh, for what you want. But at the same time, Spencer Dimwitty has proven. He prov proved it last season in the absence of D'Angelo. And this season, I remember sitting out the tweet to you, and I saw it on Draft Express. He's in the 90th percentile in pick and roll points per possession, uh, just over 1.05 uh, points per, per 100. It's insane. 
you know, for him, he's in the range of like guys like Tobias Harris, LeBron James. You know, he is an elite guard when, you know, he attacks the switches. His aggression is insane. We weren't even talking about that so much last year in terms of Spencer Dillon. It was all about the assist to turnover ratio, how awesome a passer he is, how careful he is, how methodical he is. So to have that balance to his game, who knows what he could be in three seasons' time and even next season as well. You know, throughout the season, he's continuing to show growth. He's, you know, uh, become super duper efficient as well. Well, um, it's just a, a really nice thing and, and an awesome thing for, for Nets fans and for Spencer individually. Yeah, and even if he doesn't, he's not necessarily the starter at this price, you don't mind paying him. And you could probably make an argument that you almost need three or four playmaking guards or players on your team. So I think Dinwiddie getting him, keeping him with the team, knowing what he can do. And like you said, Jack, as a pick and roll player, he's been really efficient. I think Synergy had him ranked in fifth in efficiency. So big props to the Nets for keeping him for uh, two more years. Yeah, it's just the the right decision that we made. Uh, I was almost, you know, getting a little bit angry yesterday that it hadn't happened yet. Uh, but the fact that it happened, you know, just the next day and, you know, a great deal for both parties. You know, Spencer is only going to get better. We haven't seen the best of Spencer, the best of Spencer Dinwiddie yet. You know, he's you know, decision-making still at times in terms of shot selection, you know, can can still improve. You know, last night, you know, against Philly, you know, some of those insane shots that he continues to make, you know, he's become a real a three-point threat and, you know, he's it, that's reflected in his percentage as well. So for him to, you know, it's, it's good to see that we're going to have a nucleus going forward because, you know, who knows what can happen in the free agency period? Who knows what can happen in the draft? But to see this happen, I think a lot of guys, you know, who are, you know, the incoming class are going to want to get drafted to the Brooklyn Nets because they know what our player development is and they know that we reward the guys that we develop and the guys that produce on the court. It was reflected in Joe Harris. It's reflected in Spencer Dewey. It'll probably be reflected in Carol Savert. The answer to Russell's another question, but Jared Allen's likely to get paid as well. So, you know, if you work for our team and you fit well with our team, then it's going to be all gro- all roses. Yeah, exactly. And it's really just nice to see. And you mentioned the other guys, obviously, D'Angelo. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And just talking about Dinwiddie, I think after last night's game, it only helped him build more confidence. You know, post Karis LeVert, he's averaged over 19 points per game, got to the free throw line over six times a game, 47% from the field, 34% from three, over five assists, two rebounds, and just a hair over two turnovers. So if he's able to maintain these numbers, which he's done for pretty much over a month now, it would be an outstanding contract and an outstanding season for Dinwiddie. I mean, it already is. And I think, you know, you can expect maybe some of the efficiency to drop a little bit. 47% from the field is is awesome. Uh, but you obviously expect maybe a little bit of a dip here and there. But, you know, Carol Silvert isn't that far away. He's not going to be out for three, four months. It seems more to be arranged to two to three, two and a half. Uh, if you know if all things do go well, so I'm interested to see as well how they can mesh together because you know D'Angelo and Spencer have had their issues in terms of meshing on the court. You know Kenny seems to have the confidence in Spencer, seeing as he's repaid the faith. He's also got a little more better defensive acumen as well. You know you you marvelled at that a little bit uh, in, in previous episodes as well, Nick. So Spencer's doing all the right things, and for him to get repaid the faith, you know with this uh, nice contract, it's just you know it, it, it's reflected in what the Nets organization is doing and the culture that they're building. And, you know, I'm very excited to see what Spencer can become, you know, in these next three years. What type of deal do you think he would have got offered in, you know, unrestricted free agency? It depends, Nick. If Orlando and Phoenix were still in the market, San Antonio as well, I could see anything upwards of 15 to 16 million per. You know, if you compare this to, say, a guy like Marcus Smart, who's on 452, um, oh, I think Spencer Dinwiddie, is as good a player. Very, very different players, but they're both, you know, guards. They're both, you know, uh, have a real effect on the game, obviously in, in incredibly different ways, but they're those sort of, you know, uh, 10 to $15 million guys that you need to have on uh, the roster in terms of having that contract flexibility, whether it's for trading or whether it's just to have, you know, just to maneuver because you can't have, you know, basically what, you know, uh, Houston and Washington have you can't have guys on 25 30 you know plus million dollar deals and then just a heap of filler guys you know at the sort of uh, minimum or you know the the uh, mid-level exception and such so I think you know anywhere from 15 to 16 million dollars per annum I, I wouldn't be surprised if that was offered to him yeah, I think that's about right. Some team could even offer more if it was a shorter deal because he's just, you know, looking to kind of test him out and keep that flexibility for a team like that. So 
I think it was a steal. And it, like you said, it was almost getting scary to the point where maybe Dinwiddie was going to play so well that he was going to start turning down the extension. You know what I mean? We thought if yeah. he was going to sign it, it was going to be four years, 47.5 mil. And it seems like from Dinwiddie's side, he didn't want that length of a contract. He wanted to get back in free agency. That's obviously why he advocated for the player option. So it's nice that the Nets got him at this price right now because, like I said, he's playing so well, those numbers could go up. And when a player has a career game like he did last night, 39 points and beating some great defense, you know, he's scoring on Joel Embiid, and I think his layup package has really improved. Who knows what his value really could be in the summer if he continues to play at such a high rate. Yeah, the layup package has been something that I've just been absolutely marveling at. It's the array of moves and the the angles and the strength and the creativity and the flexibility and just the body contortion. And the key stat when we were talking about yesterday, Nick, is the amount of times that he is going to the line. And you mentioned like six times. You know, that for me is showing that he is attacking and it, and it opens up so many areas of the floor for guys like Joe Harris and, you know, uh, Alan Crabb, who, you know, are much better when, you know, they've got the, their less contested looks. And guys like Karis LeVert and Spencer Dinwiddie open up those lanes for them as well. Uh, D'Angelo Russell obviously is a little bit more craftier and sort of is a little bit more methodical and a, more of a, a mid-range sort of savant. But for Spencer to keep doing what he is doing right now, he's easily going to exceed that value because there are plenty of guys who are on more lofty contracts who aren't producing. Yeah, and I think, you know, we talked about the uh, field goal percentage being so high. I think it will take a slight dip, but I think it's so high is because he's spending so much time driving to the rim. He's not really settling, and he's attacking the rim. And one thing, you know, he's still complaining about calls here and there, but he's focusing on making the shot and not just getting the contact. Yeah, I think he's getting a little bit more respect now. And I That's think it, that yeah. this contract gives him some validation. And, you know, coaches are people too. You know, you don't necessarily know the teams who are losing, the players who are on the mid-level exceptions, the min the minimum contracts. But Spencer Dinwiddie is now, you know, he's got the respect, you know, from the outside world. You know, he's getting, you know, uh, it was awesome, that, you know, when Woj put out that tweet, you know, when Woj put something out and Shams put something out, they're trying to battle each other to get that bomb. You know, you're getting some respect around there. And, you know, Spencer is, deserves it more than any because he's worked as hard as anyone. Uh, and I think, you know, for him to get that validation is awesome for him individually. But I don't think it's going to change, you know, his mentality going forward because we know how good he wants to be and we know how much he wants to win. And, you know, he's a very intelligent guy as well. And for him to get this validation as well is going to help his individual brand, which I think is going to be good for him and those uh, very nice kicks. Yeah, exactly. And the dream project, which he works on, obviously helping yeah. the community is big for him. And Spencer's also a great person off the court. So it's always nice to see those type of people win. But uh, switching over topics a little bit, how does this extension impact D'Angelo? I know we kind of mentioned the last few shows, but now it actually happened. Yeah, I mean, it's we sort of talked about it uh, a little bit, Nick, and it's going to be a, probably a sticking point going forward and a talking point going forward. You know, he's seen Spencer has earned this money now. What does that do for Delo's mentality? Does it change things at all? You know, does he still say, you know, the, the I mean, their cap holds are still different. You know, I think Bobby Marks put out something for his PN. You know, uh, the 1.6 million free agent hold uh, in 2019, 2020 is replaced by the 10.6 that he'll be on the first season. D'Angelo is going to be on around 21, I believe. So that cap hold is going to be, you know, pretty Big. massive. It's massive. So, you know, D'Angelo, do we renounce, renounce his rights? Obviously, you know, there might be some teams that are uh, heading after him. It's it's hard to say because spent the D'Angelo says all the right things. And when he's playing well, you know, he is almost, you know, the focal point of this team. And, you know, Spencer can take a bit of a backseat and still have an impact. But when it seems Spencer is playing well, it's very rarely that we see D'Angelo playing as well uh, on the same sort of night. So I think he needs to sort of bridge that gap. And and maybe this is a little bit of motivation for him. You know, he talked about, he said that, you know, seeing his friends get paid and Carl Anthony Tance and Devin Booker, that would be a little bit of motivation. But, you know, the inconsistency for me is, is one thing that Spencer has rubbed out of his game, but it's still a real major uh, emphasis for, for D'Angelo. He needs to become a more consistent guy if, you know, we are going to pay him. 
Yeah, it's and I think the consistency even comes that he's expected to be at a higher level because he's looking for a bigger contract or that cap hold being around 21 mil. It just, you know, is a lot of space to use up. And obviously, even if they were to resign them, if you got D'Angelo under 20, like we've talked about somewhere between 15 and 20, depending on how he plays the rest of the season, you don't necessarily mind locking up 30 plus mil to the point guard position because it's so important, especially if you believe in these guys. But if he doesn't, then it's like, all right, what do we have with D'Angelo? I think there's just so much of a question mark where we really can't answer the question until we see him play the rest of the year. And obviously now there's more pressure added, you know, whether we think so or not. It's just how the situation is. So I'm really intrigued to see how he kind of reacts to it. Yeah, and, and what sort of his agents uh, and, and his sort of team, you know, how they react to it and sort of what they're going to like. Okay, so Spencer gets this. This is what we can earn ourselves. They'll be looking at the salary cap as well. I know Sean Marks will be certainly looking at that as well in terms of the free agency status. You know, does he think he deserves, you know, 15 to 20 like you mentioned, Nick? You know, is it a long-term, you know, three to four-year deal? Is it a short-term with some player options in there or something? Or is it like a Jabari Parker sort of thing where it's two for 40? Um, you know, it's it, there's going to be plenty of sort of options, and I'm sure that they're they're already sort of talking about it, you know, in the front office and with the agents. But obviously, they keep a pretty tight ship out in uh, Brooklyn land, so it'll be interesting to see, you know, how it all plays out. But it's going to be on D'Angelo at the end of the day if he can perform well enough and you know get to a level of consistency, you know, where he is producing, you know, 17 and eight, 17 and seven, and you know, on solid efficiency. Because for me. That's going to be the number one thing for him. If he can be an efficient and effective and impactful player, you know, when he is not playing well. And we've seen him do that a few times, but probably not enough for him to, you know, warrant uh, an early extension. And that's why we didn't offer him that early extension. So uh, the ball is certainly in D'Angelo Russell's court, you know, part of my French. Yeah, no, I think you're right, Jack. And I think the fact is that we want to see consistency on the huff, hustle and the defensive plays. You know, the small things, when a shot's not falling, he's still having a great impact on the game. And we've seen that a couple times, but not enough where it's like, all right, we're willing to give him big money. There's still some, you know, nervous factor with D'Angelo, but also he's still 22 years old. Now, obviously, now there's, you know, Nets Twitter went crazy after the extension. D'Angelo fans were mad and whatnot, and there's a ton of trade scenarios. Do you think there's a possibility we see D'Angelo trade it before the deadline? It certainly increases that likelihood, Nick, but I'm not sure by how much. Um, because you have Spencer Dinwiddie now locked up to a semi-long-term deal. And he can be uh, a starter, as we've mentioned, at length. And not just for the Nets, but for many other teams. So it certainly does change things somewhat in terms of D'Angelo's situation. But what are teams going to be willing to take on for him? What is the package centered around D'Angelo Russell? You know, I think it made a lot more sense, you know, sort of debating that and, and thinking about that with Spencer because we've sort of seen it a little bit. Like you mentioned with the Cavaliers, you know, last season. Whereas D'Angelo, you know, if you're willing to take him on as another team, you're going to have to be willing to pay him going forward. You know, similar to sort of Jimmy Butler, but obviously this is going to be D'Angelo's first extension. So he's going to want you know, some long-term money, some locked-up money because he hasn't got that yet. And it's going to be, you know, is he a starter? He, I don't think he's proven himself. He's a starter for some teams, but he's not, you know, a top 10, top 15, you know, guard. Whereas I think, you know, Spencer Dinwiddie is around that conversation, more top 15, but, you know, he's certainly a proven starter. Um, So for the teams willing to take D'Angelo on, you know, I, I think he makes sense in Phoenix and makes sense in Orlando because he fits their timeline as well. And, uh, you know, in, in a lot of other factors too. But it's going to be on them. It's going to be a probably a completely new situation. And the ball becomes uh, fully in those teams and those front offices court to go, well, what do we offer him now? Uh, it's going to be, you know, the February 7 deadline. You know, it's it's, it's going to rapidly approach. And, and what is Spencer proving on the court at that stage? What are, How desperate are other teams to sort of make a move? Is Orlando going to throw the bus at it in terms of the fact that, you know, they're sort of wanting to hover around that sort of... And do the Nets, you know, make a deal with Orlando because, you know, they're another team who will probably be fighting around that sort of eight spot, seven spot four as well. So th there's plenty of things to consider. 
Yeah, it's definitely something we'll be talking about probably up to the deadline because there's going to be interest because he is a talented player and he's so young that I think some of the teams maybe will take a chance on him. And I think if you do trade for him, you're looking to probably pay him a good chunk of money, probably something closer to four years and 80 million, because that's probably a number that he really wants. And I think there might be a team out there to offer him. If he continues even at the same rate he is right now, his numbers aren't outstanding, but he's still teasing you enough with all the flashes, flashes of brilliance. He doesn't deserve four years 80 for me, Nick. And, and no, I, think I don't he, think he does either. I'm just saying I think someone will still do it. Oh, yeah. There, there'll be a team that's maybe a, a very small handful of teams that could do that. But they'd be sort of silly to do so. If you look at, you know, I'm probably going to continue to look at a guy like Zach Levine as the sort of model. You know, they're not necessarily the same sort of player, but they are guards. They have an immense talent and they haven't reached their ceiling. They've had their injury issues as well. You know, 472, a lot of teams, uh, when Sacramento offered that, were like, you know, why would the Bulls match that? There's no point to it. But a, a lot of other people are saying, well, they have to because, you know, they made the trade for him when it came for Jimmy Butler as well. So uh, I think, yeah, D'Angelo's the situation is a little bit different, obviously. But, you know, the, the number, obviously, is going to be a fascinating one in terms of what he does sign for. Four years, three years, is it a Jabari Parker, Julius Randle style, where he bets on himself and gets some player options or whatever, puts himself back on the market. I think D'Angelo would be looking for that long-term, you know, um, long-term sort of uh, financial uh, comfort. comfort. Um, but at the same time, you know, there's a lot of things that need to be considered from, you know, the front offices that are willing to offer him the money. Yeah, I think if you're trading for him, though, you have to be willing to probably match this similar to the Zach Levine offer because somebody might throw it out there. That's something you have to be prepared for if you're going to make a trade for him because you really don't know what the market's going to be like. Yeah, uh, it's always... And with, you know, the, the free agents that are on the market this season in terms of Kevin Durant, you know, Kawhi Leonard, uh, Clay Thompson, Kyrie Irving, a lot of, these, a lot of those guys seem to be pretty secure where they are. You know, Kevin Durant, Kawhi Leonard, maybe a little bit less so. And Tobias Harris, is a team willing to go all out for, for a young guy who is still unproven? Because like I mentioned before, you're paying for potential on this deal a lot as well. So you're paying for what he is going to become. And D'Angelo Russell has shown flashes, but I don't think he's shown, you know, enough flashes to sort of go, you're worth this, you know, uh, we can safely say that you're going to uh, match the value of this deal or exceed it. Um, you know, there, I even think that there is, you know, an element of hesitation of like, you know, a more team friendly, like four years, $60 million, because even then, you know, with his injury issues as well, you know, I don't want to be the, the D'Angelo downer, but, uh, I think there are a lot of questions despite all the talent that he does have. Yeah, I, like you said, it would almost benefit him. I believe he would, could only get a two-year deal if he was renounced because I believe Jabari Parker and uh, Julius yep. Randle were both renounced. So he could get the th three- or four-year deal probably in an offer sheet. But for the two-year deal, I think that would actually almost benefit him and the team because they could do this similar to the Parker thing where maybe they're overpaying for two years and the second year is a team option. And then that kind of gives him himself, like you said, Teams might be wary of trying to giving him an, a long-term contract. Who knows? Maybe he doesn't like any of the offers. He signs a qualifying offer with whatever team has him, if it's the Nets or if he's traded somewhere else. What teams do you think, Nick? You know, I touched on Phoenix or Orlando. What the it's, you know, uh, plenty of our guys on Twitter, plenty of our fans, you know, I think D-Rock put out some things saying that, you know, three or four teams. What other teams or what are the, the likely teams that could be after D'Angelo services if they aren't the Nets? Uh, I'll have to take a quick peek at the salary cap just because I don't want to like throw out some names. That, that, yeah. uh, but I think uh, you look at a team like Cleveland, if they're able to move up some more cap space, open some more cap space, that's a potential, you know, all-star that you maybe take a chance on. You yep. know what I mean? If things don't work out, let's say hypothetically Charlotte were to lose Kemba Walker. That's another possibility. I think any team that maybe isn't necessarily confident in signing a big time star and maybe they're trying to bring in somebody else who who could turn into a star or they could develop into a star. Yeah, I'm intrigued by the the Cleveland option. I haven't really thought about it. You know, Colin Sexton and D'Angelo Russell, I think D'Angelo loves to have the ball in his hands so much. And Colin Sexton, you know, his form of late has shown that, you know, he works best with the ball in his hands as well. I personally think D'Angelo works better as a sort of off guard next to guys like Karis Levert, uh, and Spencer Dewey, obviously the chemistry with Spencer Dewey hasn't been as great. 
Um, it's going to be interesting to see how he can show his effectiveness in different situations. Um, there'll be there'll be teams out there that are looking for for a young guard because this is a, a point guard league, like you've said, Nick. Um, and I think a lot of teams sort of have that guy already. But for the teams that don't, you know, D'Angelo's you know the sort of perfect guy to take a flyer on. Yeah, exactly. If you just are, I mean, I think even with the Cleveland situation to an extent too is like. They're at a point where they just need to bring in talent. I don't think there's any guarantee Colin Sexton's, you know, the starting point guard for the future. Obviously, it was still a high pick, but I think you just bring as much talent, you kind of work it out afterwards. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I'd be fascinated to see what they would, you know, be willing to offer him. You know, I think, you know, Dan Gilbert loves those sort of gritty guys and D'Angelo Russell. I'm not sure in, in terms of their coaching, you know, situation as well, seeing how that sort of pans out. You know, D'Angelo Russell has had, you know, a, a, a Lou, a string of coaches uh, since his time uh, in LA. And he's benefited from consistency with Kenny. But, you know, I've even noticed, you know, little points uh, at times. It just seems like uh, he can't find the... He can't find himself as an NBA player. We know what he is in terms of the person. And he's... You know, an, an awesome guy. He's got a fantastic personality, incredibly marketable, a really great guy, really, you know, articulate, really well-spoken, you know, really teachable. But he can't seem to just put it all together uh, in the most important part when it comes on the court. And, you know, the hardest thing for any young guy is to find consistency. Um, but that is going to be, you know, ultimately the thing that will be become between him and a, a massive payday. Do you think that the Knicks would throw an offer sheet at him if they struck out struck out on all you know the all stars and the big names out there? Um, I think almost they've got Trey Burke, who is for me a guy who has proven himself to be a sort of similar player to D'Angelo. He can you know just nail jumpers left, right, and center. Doesn't necessarily and is probably maybe a touch more athletic as well. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily, if you've got Trey Burke and D'Angelo Russell as, you know, uh, a core of your sort of guards, two of your three guards, you know, and maybe Nilla Kinn, I'm not sure how, you know, how they are on him. You know, obviously Alonzo Tria is now signed to a couple of years as well. I personally wouldn't. If I were the, the New York Knicks, I'd be more inclined if I was, you know, Phoenix or, or Orlando, I think. It makes a lot more sense there. But, you know, I'd probably go if out of the teams that we've sort of said so far, Phoenix and Orlando are in a sort of tier of their own. And there could be another team, uh, maybe even a San Antonio. I'm not sure. You know, pairing him alongside DeJounte Murray, you know, uh, he doesn't seem like uh, that he would flourish on a guy like Greg Popovich. But that's just me. That's just my personal, you know, uh, subjective opinion. But that's another team that can use some sort of guard depth and a guy who can score. And um, we know Greg Popovich loves the mid-ranger, so he could sort of fit there as an offensive piece. So there are plenty of sort of teams around there, but it's it's all about, you know, D'Angelo Russell needs to prove himself that he can sort of, you know, uh, warrant, you know, those teams, you know, investing in his services. Yeah, I think it's any team that is looking for a point guard and is going to strike out because there's limited names out there. And I think for the Knicks situation, I don't think they're really invested in Trey Burke. I think that's a guy that, you know, kind of a short-term fix because he doesn't really have starter potential at that size. Another team that obviously it wouldn't maybe make sense, but they've made a ton of bad moves in the past, especially contract-wise. Chicago is going to have cap space. They're looking to sign a big name, and they could possibly miss out on obviously all the all-stars with the situation going on there. But D'Angelo and Levine backcourt is not very good defensively. Oh, man, that would be but horrific. They signed Jabari Parker this year, so I wouldn't put it past him. That's a fair call, Nick. Yeah, you make sense. You know, obviously their front office. Um, it almost reminds me. It it. I love having this superiority complex of our of our front office these days. Being able to go, man, the Chicago front office. Whereas back in the days where it was Billy King, when I started to become a fan, it was just like, you know, I couldn't really talk. But these days, I can sort of go, well, I've got Sean Marks. You know, uh, sort of heading up my things as as my favorite team. You know, who you guys got? And you know, there are plenty of other teams. It's, it starts from the top down. It starts from ownership down. And, you know, Mikhail Prokhorov taking a little bit of a backseat, letting sort of Sean Marks and Coach Kenny do their thing, become the face of the organization, has, you know, done wonders for us. And it's been reflected in, you know, the deals for Spencer. And, you know, D'Angelo, who has become a better player, obviously, marginally, I think that he has still has incredible potential. And, you know, he's he, he was almost like a Derek Rose type in terms of the fandom that he gets. He gets obviously, you know, Derek Rose is an MVP and has proven himself to be, you know, a, a bona fide superstar. 
But, you know, when you know, teams clamor to their favorite players and the fans, you know, we are a sort of fan player driven league more so these days than we are team driven. You know, not many guys are tied to their teams. And I think I, I may have done a piece or someone else has done a piece of OGD basketball about that. So D'Angelo Russell is sort of, you know, an entity of his own within the Brooklyn Nets organization. Yeah, it's definitely something to keep an eye on. Obviously, if you go on Twitter for more than like five minutes, you can definitely feel that too. Uh, but what would be, what do you want to see from D'Angelo the rest of the year that would make you confident in Nets re-signing him? Uh, I think it's going to be about balance, Nick. And I'm being able to sort of, you know, balance and awareness and, you know, it's not necessarily basketball IQ, but it's, I can't think of a better word for it. But being able to know when and how to make the right plays and how to impact. If there are nights where you're just having 10, 5, and 5, but you're still effective and, you know, you're putting up, you know, it's, it's 5 of 10 from the field rather than, like, you know, you know 3 of 13, then that's what I'm going to be happy with. You know, it's sort of just being able to be an effective, consistent player. Uh, they're sort of, you know, real cliches. But, you know, they're cliche, like I sort of say uh, consistently, cliches are cliches for a reason because, you know, they do ring true. And, you know, it is what has earned Spencer his payday, you know, being able to take a step forward in terms of his effectiveness and efficiency. Uh, I think that's what we expect from D'Angelo. I think we've sort of seen that from him in terms of his passing. I think his passing has... Uh, he's been able to clean up the turnovers for the most part. You know, last season we sort of harped on it quite a bit. But I think the next step for him is going to be being able to clean up his sort of field goal percentages. Not necessarily clean it up, but you know, it's sort of shot selection and get you know, to the rim more. Get Easy. to the rim more. But uh, um, when I put out the sort of uh, thread of the um, the players and their field goal percentages, D'Angelo Russell was at like forty two percent around the paint, which is pretty horrific and and i think if you're comparing him to a guy maybe like a lonzo ball who also isn't great around the rim but i think lonzo has a bit more x factor and spark and athleticism than him but i think d'angelo russell needs to realize he has a bit of strength about him as well uh he knows his floater but i just don't know if he's confident or if he has that in him at this stage you know for me the number one sort of play that sticks out for me in terms of being able to get to the rim, is that preseason play, you know, the final play against the Knicks. That's one that has stuck out for me in my brain about being able to get to the rim and sort of using his crafty dribble and, you know, his sort of, um, you know, the, the different types of athleticism, so to speak, that he has. But I'm just not sure he has that in him, uh, so to speak, to become a really effective guy around the rim, which is what the Nets want and what a lot of guys want from your point guard. Yeah, and I th honestly think some of it is just missing shots he can make. How many times have we seen him get to the rim, beat his defender, have a good look at the rim, and he just misses the layup? That happens yeah. way too much for him. And I think that also would come – a higher field goal percentage would come with getting there more consistently. You know what I mean? If you're only taking a few shots a game, obviously your percentage isn't going to be great. I think you just need to continue to attack more. And like you said, that last play in the preseason against the Knicks when he tried to dunk on Cornette – Go hard. Go hard to the rim. Use that size. Use that strength that you're kind of developing right now. And I think it would really add to his game and it would add to his value and his contract number this summer because nobody really wants a guard that can do all this craftiness, get past the defender, but then get to the rim and miss the layup. Yeah, I think a lot of it as well is that, you know, he doesn't have the confidence to do that. And I think a lot of guys, you know, and, and it makes sense because, you know, at the end of the day, field goal percentages and, and you're sort of scoring – is what gets you paid at the end of the day. And because if he's not making those shots and, you know, he would much rather be in his comfort zone of shooting those mid-ranges and missing them because at least he knows, well, look, I'm a good mid-range shooter. If I miss this, you know, at least I know I can hit the next one. Whereas if he doesn't sort of get that first sort of shot around the rim, you know, at least get the foul call. Uh, another sort of number that I'd be looking at as well, Nick, is free throw attempts. Uh, we sort of talked about that with Spencer and you talked about in terms of getting around to the rim. You know, if he's not getting three, four, uh, I think four might be a bit much, but, you know, a two and a half, three per game, then he's just not doing... Just two fouls a game is four. It's not even a crazy amount. Just getting fouled two times going to the rim. Yeah, exactly. And I think if, you know, you look to what, he, what his uh, backcourt mates are doing, there's no reason why he can't do that. And I think, you know, he needs to be able to, you know, refine his game to a point where he can make those plays because then it can open it can open up the lanes for him and open up sort of the mid-range game for him as well because we know that that is where he's a, he is elite, but it doesn't necessarily fit the modern NBA nor what the Brooklyn Nets are wanting. Exactly. So, but Jack, any last thoughts on the Dinwiddie perspective of this before we get out of here? 
Oh, I'm just incredibly happy for Spencer. You know, I'm, I'm awesome. I'm really excited to see how the year pans out for him, just individually, his brand as well. Um, maybe he might sneak onto the Brooklyn Buzz at some stage. We might, <laughs> we might get him on. We'll see how we go when we get over to the States. When I'm in the States as well, we might try and sneak a couple of uh, sound bites from him as well. But uh, I'm really excited to see him in person as well when I'm over there in January. You, all the Buzz fans, and uh, it's just uh, positive news for the Nets. And positive news for the NBA in general because, you know, he's the come-up story and, and, you know, guys like Alonzo Trier uh, as well. I'm a big fan of his as well. I know Mike Ryan, our guy at um, OTD Basketball as well, is a big fan. So to see these guys that have sort of, you know, come from nothing, it's the sort of thing that fairy tale and Disney movies are made of. Yeah, no, it's great. It's a great, you know, thing for the league, great thing for the G League as well. So just happy for Spence, like you said, happy for the Nets getting a player of his caliber and locking him up. It's just great for the franchise. But as always, you can check us out on iTunes, Blog Talk Radio, OTGBasketball.com, NetsRepublic.com, Dash Radio, and YouTube. Any type of support is appreciated as always.